So we know that the ankle dorsiflexors are the peroneus tertius, the tibialis anterior, and the extensor digitorum longus, as well as the extensor hallucis longus. Uh, these muscles do have other functions on the foot and ankle, but for our video's purpose, we will just be focusing on their action of dorsiflexion. So now that we've briefly discussed the muscles that contribute to ankle dorsiflexion, let's talk about the gait pattern of someone dealing with weakness or other issues with these muscles. During gait, the muscles outlined above are responsible for helping the body clear the foot during the sw swing phase and control plantar flexion of the foot on heel strike. Foot drop deals with significant weakness of ankle and toe dorsiflexion. As we can see in the picture, during initial contact or heel strike, the ground reaction force passes behind the ankle and the knee, causing ankle plantar flexion. It is important to note that the musculature of the calf is not causing the plantar flexion. The ground reaction force is. Plantar flexion occurs um, when uh, we need eccentric control from dorsiflexors to control the foot to the ground. If dorsiflexors are weak and cannot eccentrically control the shock of plantar flexion during heel strike, the foot will slap the ground, also known as foot drop. Here we see a perfect example of foot drop on the right side. See right here on initial contact with that right heel, those dorsiflexors cannot control the plantar flexion from the ground reaction force. We might also see that the foot catches during swing phase before uh, initial contact of the heel actually happens on the right foot. There's the catch right there. We might also see a toe drag during swing. Here's a couple more seconds of toe drag for you guys. Finally, we may see a compensatory mechanism from a patient with dorsiflexor weakness where they walk with an exaggerated flexion of the hip and knee to prevent the toes from catching on the ground during swing phase. Weakness may be due to lack of use or age, as well as many neuromuscular disorders. One disease process I would like to briefly focus on I am currently dealing with myself on my right side. Nerve entrapment. The trapping or compression of a peripheral nerve by bone or tendon or a tunnel of connective tissue. Genetics have to do with the size of the tunnel and peripheral nerves travel in. Some people have congenitally smaller tunnels and with aging, previous injury, degeneration, and inflammation, these tunnels can become crowded. Mechanically, overuse syndrome can cause tendons to swell and crowd out the nerve. It continues down the lower leg to lie between the peroneal tendon and the lateral edge of the gastrocnemius. If the nerve becomes entrapped close by the fibular head, we could see both sensory or motor deficits. If the compressed nerve has strictly a pure sensory distribution, no motor weakness will be present and therefore no atrophy can occur. Atrophy only occurs when the muscle belly shrinks due to a lack of nerve supply. Motor nerve loss typically occurs gradually. There are rare circumstances, however, where the entire muscle group can fail all at once. In a leg with peroneal neuropathy, this might manifest as foot drop, as we talked about earlier inability to hold the foot up when walking. I decided running was a brilliant idea and after about two weeks of running while in the act below my right knee on the lateral portion of my leg went half numb with pins and needles. Now I have a positive Tinel sign and a sharp electric like zing down my peroneal nerve whenever I put pressure on my fibular neck. I think it is a result of overuse syndrome and I do get mild foot drop, especially when walking downhill, when more work is required from dorsiflexors to control plantar flexion. Entrapment of the common peroneal nerve can occur anywhere along its path through the lower extremity. 
One of the more common places for entrapment to occur is right below the fibular head. We know the sciatic nerve gives birth to both the common peroneal and tibial nerves. As the peroneal nerve passes the lateral condyle of the femur and crosses the knee joint, it curves over the posterior rim of the fibular neck to the anterior compartment of the lower leg, dividing into the superficial and deep branches. Because the peroneal nerve is so superficial, it is also highly susceptible to injury from trauma or crush. Even crossing your leg over the other too often while relaxing could cause peroneal nerve issues as you are placing the knee under a varus stress and keeping the nerve in a stretched position that it does not appreciate. Now let's talk about treatment. Uh, treatment for general weakness could include various strengthening exercises, such as four-way ankle passive resistive exercise uh, with an exercise band. Um, or without a band, you could just utilize gravity itself and do seated or standing toe lifts. One of my favorites in the clinic is walking on your heels, working to keep your toes up in the, the air the entire time, isometrically strength, strengthening ankle dorsiflexors. For entrapment, um, treatment would depend on the severity of the symptoms. With increasing symptoms, medications such as NSAIDs, Motrin, or Aleve can be helpful. Steroid injections may or may not provide relief. If symptoms continue without relief or motor weakness occurs, surgical decompression of the nerve can provide long-term relief.